um, even though this is not a, um, a formal um, type of practice, let me just ask everybody before we begin um, to be as present as you possibly can. Um, while the topic is important, uh, I want to recognize that all of the people here in the room, you have come here uh, both to learn, to engage with one another, uh, and to hear a little bit from Jeff about his journey and what he has helped to build at LinkedIn. So the only operating agreement that I have with everybody is to be present and to be open uh, and to enjoy. We'll do an interview for about 20 minutes, and then we'll stop, and we'll have a microphone to go around for folks to engage uh, in a good Q&A session. So uh, with that, Jeff. David. Uh, Jeff and I first met probably two years ago at a dinner uh, here in the area. Um, I have a mindfulness practice. I met Jeff uh, and his wife, Lizette, uh, there, um, and learned that they also, he also has a practice. Uh, and so that was wonderful to hear that the CEO of LinkedIn uh, obviously was deeply engaged and aware in that way. But the thing that stood out for me was when, Jeff, you started to talk about your vision of compassionate leadership and what it meant in a way that, as Soren just said, I had never heard a corporate CEO talk about that. And so before you even dig into what that means for you, everything has an origin story. That had to come from somewhere. And so if you could, if you could dig in a little bit about. Sure. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for taking the time to be up on stage. I could just as easily be interviewing David. And uh, you're in for a real treat later when Soren does that. Uh, I have a tremendous amount of respect and admiration for the work that you've done historically and you're doing now. And uh, I'm really privileged to be working more closely with David on some of the themes we're going to be talking about today. Uh, going forward, so thank you for thank you. for being here. Uh, the origin story, right? We're in Silicon Valley. Everything has to have an origin story. <laughs> uh, so the origin story for me probably started uh, around uh, the age of 30. I, I read a book called The Art of Happiness uh, by Howard Cutler. How many people in the audience have read The Art of Happiness? So for those that haven't, I can't recommend it strongly enough. It's uh, the teachings of the Dalai Lama. And it was in that book that I first became aware of uh, the meaning of compassion, the definition of compassion, and perhaps even more importantly, uh, the difference between compassion and empathy, which I think like a lot of folks in Western society, I had a tendency to use uh, those two terms synonymously. And uh, the Dalai Lama uh, explained uh, very eloquently uh, that empathy was really about feeling what another living thing is uh, experiencing or feeling. And compassion is putting yourself in the shoes of another person, seeing the world through their lens for the sake of alleviating their suffering, classically defined. And he went on to paint this very vivid picture, uh, which I, I carry with me to this day. By the way, um, this book was so meaningful to me that it is still on my nightstand. Mm. So 19 years later, I've only read it cover to cover once. Mm. And just seeing the spine of the book brings me right back mm. to that moment when I first discovered uh, these, these stories and, and, and super valuable passages. But at any rate, uh, he painted this really vivid picture that uh, illustrates the difference. And uh, if you were to be walking along a mountainous trail uh, and came across someone that uh, what, had a boulder on their chest, they were suffocating as a result of having a boulder on their chest, the empathetic response uh, would be to render you uh, helpless. You wouldn't be able to do anything about it because you'd be feeling the same sense of suffocation. Mm -hmm. Uh, the compassionate response would be to recognize that they're suffering, that they're suffocating, perhaps drawing upon a similar experience. That's where empathy comes into play. Mm -hmm. I have once suffocated or I was suffocating and I know that that person is suffering. And then doing everything within your power to remove the boulder from their chest. And put another way, he didn't necessarily articulate it like this, but put another way, uh, to me, compassion is empathy plus action, mm. which is very similar uh, to what we just heard. Right. Um, and that was a very hard act to follow. That was going to be a hard act to follow before the compassion tie-in. Right. I was like, Judd right. that's cool, high energy. And then he was like. And then he dropped the mic. He dropped the mic. Um, so that was very impressive. So at any rate, uh, that was really uh, eye-opening for me. It wouldn't be until uh, years later. Uh, I was uh, working uh, at Yahoo. 
And uh, I ended up in a, in a pretty significant operating role, and I had very little operating experience. And like a lot of uh, inexperienced uh, executives, I just assumed uh, people on my team should do things the way I did them. Mm. And that's not uncommon, I, I, especially for inexperienced executives. You think, well, the reason I'm in this role is because I've had some success achieving certain objectives, and so the way I'm doing things will make sense for other people to do them the same way. And, and nothing could be further from the truth. Sure, you may have developed some best practices that other people can benefit from and, and learn from. Uh, but if you're expecting people to do things the way you do, it, it's going to be suboptimal on, a, on multiple fronts. And, uh, I learned this lesson in a really unusual way. Uh, I was uh, on a, a, a team. I had uh, a number of colleagues, and we all reported to a very senior executive at the company. And uh, this executive had a tendency to undermine uh, one of my colleagues during staff meetings. And uh, he was very quick-witted, uh, the executive that we all reported to. And he would make jokes at my colleague's expense, especially when he became frustrated with the fact that this person wasn't doing things the way our boss expected them to be done. And it's important to keep in mind that my colleague was doing a really good job. He was quite effective in his role. It just didn't look and sound like the way our boss would have wanted it to get done. And uh, these jokes and the, the tension that was created as a result was really demoralizing, not just to my colleague, but to all of us. And it undermined the person in charge. And at some point, I had had enough. And so during a one-on-one, -on -one, uh, we were sitting down and, and discussing. I said, I'd like to give you some candid feedback. And uh, this dynamic where you get angry at our colleague, uh, the next time you feel like that, you should go find a mirror somewhere and just tee off on yourself, because you're the reason he's in the role. And you should be recognizing this person's strengths playing to his strengths, coaching him on any gaps that you believe exist. And to the extent he's not the right person for the role, he's obviously very talented, can create a lot of value for the company, put him in another role that's better suited for him, or help him find a role elsewhere and do it in a constructive way. He said, thank you for the feedback and the advice. I'll give it some thought. Several weeks later, he came back and he said, I really want to thank you. I uh, took your advice and I put it into action uh, with your colleague. And it's uh, proven so valuable, I've decided I'm going to do that with other members of my team, really with everyone I work with. And as he was saying this, mm -hmm. I felt uh, so chagrined because I recognized in that moment I was doing the exact same thing with a member of my team. Mm -hmm. And I mean the exact same thing. So I just got smacked in the face by my own hypocrisy and started to reflect on that. And there was a person on my team who was interested in having a role like my role one day who didn't necessarily have the requisite uh, skills in certain areas. And I would remind him of that. And then he would try to prove himself to me. And I mean, the back and forth and the tension and the friction. And, and this was despite the fact that this particular uh, uh, executive teammate of mine had a genius uh, for a particular uh, area. And rather than play to that strength and create the right role for him, we were trying to fit the square box or square peg into a round hole. And so um, as I reflected on this uh, with my, my manager at the time, I just kind of quietly vowed to myself that for as long as I'd be responsible for managing other people, I would aspire to manage compassionately, put myself in the shoes of the people I'm working with, understand their hopes, their dreams, their weaknesses, their frailties, their insecurities, play to their strengths, coach them on their weaknesses, and do everything within my power to set them up to be successful. I say aspire because being compassionate, especially in the workplace, which is fraught with friction and tension and disagreements and people who are at odds with one another, can be very, very challenging. But if you're committed to it, and you can become a spectator to your own thoughts, especially when you become triggered and emotional, and get out of your own head and your own emotional state and put yourself in the shoes of the other person and be there for them and support them, it can make an incredible difference to a working relationship, a team, and a company. And mm. in, in, you just said the word commitment there, Jeff. It, you have a personal mission statement. Mm -hmm. um, uh, if you don't mind sharing with, um, with our friends here today what that personal, personal mission statement is, but then talk a little bit about, that is not an easy process mm -hmm. um, to first do that and then to reconcile the two pieces of the mission statement that at first glance um, are not necessarily aligned. And so sure. I know there's a little there, but if you could dig in. 
Yeah, uh, so uh, taking a step back, I, uh, I do discern, uh, just like I think it's important to uh, separate compassion uh, from empathy, I also, I call this a personal vision and uh, delineate between a vision and a mission. I think it's important. I love this. So yeah, it's, <laughs> words have power. Yes, they do. So uh, a vision uh, to me, and uh, for those of us at LinkedIn, and we, we practice this, uh, the vision is, uh, is the true north. It's the dream, and it's there to inspire. Yeah. Uh, not necessarily measurable or realizable, uh, but it's, it's what you aspire to do. It's every the day. why. That's right. Yeah. And the mission is a singular overarching objective, which is measurable, realizable, and hopefully inspirational. So for me, this is a personal vision statement. Got it. And it's to expand the world's collective wisdom and compassion. And that started uh, differently uh, when I was at Yahoo. At one point, I uh, was part of the, the search team, recognizing that Google was doing an incredible job organizing the world's information to make it more relevant, more valuable realized that we couldn't just focus on information and started to think and study uh, the value of, of data, the relationship between data and information and knowledge and wisdom, and that's a continuum. Mm -hmm. And every step along that way, data and information, it's actually in some circles, knowledge, understanding, and wisdom uh, creates more value. And I thought one way of differentiating ourselves while I was at Yahoo was to focus on knowledge, but after Yahoo started thinking about why not just go all the way to the end state mm -hmm. and focus on somehow enabling people to tap into greater wisdom and to share their wisdom. And with the rise of social platforms, I thought uh, this might be an interesting opportunity. And I shared uh, this idea uh, with uh, a friend and a, and a former colleague, a guy named Fred Kaufman, who wrote a book called Conscious Leadership, Conscious Business. And uh, I said, I know what I want to do next. I want to help expand the world's collective wisdom. And he said, uh, that's interesting. He had that look on his face like it wasn't all the way there. And I was like, yes, what's the issue? And he's like, well, wisdom without compassion is ruthlessness. And compassion without wisdom is folly. Mm. And I was like, what? what you <laughs> Come huh? on, man, I just want some advice. Well, we were at dinner, too. We were like <laughs> drinking beer, Belgian beer, and I, it was like, that's a lot. It was brilliant. <laughs> and um, I'm sure you've experienced that. I'm sure everyone in the audience has experienced that. I really relish these moments, and I can point to a few of them. When uh, you hear something, you learn something, you're inspired by something, and in that moment, you recognize your entire worldview will never be the same. It shifts. Yeah. yeah. Oprah calls them light bulb moments, right? Yeah. So uh, there was a shift, and I said, uh, I'm changing the statement. I literally said to Fred, in, in the moment, I'm changing the statement. It'll be to help expand the world's collective wisdom and compassion. And uh, you're right, you know, holding both of them uh, simultaneously, it can be challenging. But I, I feel like compassion is the foundation for all of it. I feel like compassion uh, and this ability to, to be there for other people, uh, that wisdom, uh, knowledge, et cetera, uh, the accumulation of understanding the difference between right and wrong, which is classically defined as wisdom. Mm. Uh, it begins with compassion. It begins with awareness. It begins with your understanding of other people. It begins with that connection between individuals. Uh, so at any rate, that's the, that's the personal goal, to just try to make a dent in that somehow. So Reed Hoffman wisely brings you uh, to LinkedIn, uh, but he brings you over apparently on an interim basis. Mm. Uh, and subjects you to a very different uh, interview process. <laughs> on, on multiple levels, yeah. yeah. Uh, describe the process that you went <laughs> yeah. through. Well, there was the explicit interview process and then the implicit interview yes. process. You may be referring to the latter. I, I haven't even told you the, the former. Uh, so uh, Reid Hoffman, visionary founder of LinkedIn, founding CEO of LinkedIn, had hired a professional CEO prior to my uh, joined the company, uh, didn't work out despite the best of intentions, and, and uh, his name was Dan Nye, wonderful guy. Uh, so as Dan was transitioning out, I was at uh, Greylock, I was an executive in residence. Uh, Greylock had been one of the founding investors. Reed was very close to the partners at Greylock. They mentioned to me that LinkedIn was going to be looking for a, a new CEO. Uh, as an executive in residence, they asked if I'd be interested. I said, sure, I'd be happy to help Reed. And so Reed and I sat down, and he said, um, I don't know what you think helping me means, but I've drawn up a short list here of full-time CEOs and interim CEOs, and you're the only name on both sides. So how about it? 
<laughs> like the Fred Kaufman discussion, man. I was like, what? What's happening? <laughs> Strange few months of my life. Because the Fred dinner was just a few months prior to that. And uh, I said, whoa, well, well, I'm not yet ready. I just left Yahoo. I'm not yet ready to commit to something uh, full time permanently, but I'd love to get involved. So uh, as long as you're open to having me do it full time, I'd be happy to do it on an interim basis. And he said, as long as you're open to doing it full time, I'd be happy to have you on an interim basis. <laughs> and we said, um, uh, we said, we shook hands and said, we'll do it for as long as it makes sense. And here we are 10 and a half years mm. later. Mm. So that, that worked out OK. <laughs> so so um, here's the explicit part of the interview process that you may not have even had in mind when you were asking me the question. Reed, the way Reed describes it to this day is that we must have spent on the order of 20 to 30 hours together, uh, just the two of us talking. Talking about everything. A lot of LinkedIn, but talking about other stuff too. And that is one of the reasons we've had the success that we've had in terms of our relationship. Mm. I didn't join LinkedIn in spite of Reed. I joined LinkedIn in part because of Reed. Mm. And as a matter of fact, it was a condition that Reed stay involved for me to get involved and to join the company. So you didn't have the normal drama between the founder right. and the CEO that follows, the professional CEO, they sometimes call them in Silicon Valley circles. And so that, that was a bit unusual. But we spent time, it wasn't an interview, we spent time building a relationship. Right. And I highly, highly recommend that to any founder who is seeking to pass the baton uh, to someone after them. So that was the explicit part of the interview process. That was unusual in and of itself. But here was the, the unexpected part. So I was interim. And uh, I was going to be interim. It turned out I, I was in that interim role for, for several months. And while I was in that interim role, the board continued to evaluate other candidates. And that was expected and something we had talked about. And so I was, I was in the role. And while it was called interim, um, the day before I joined, I ended up calling Reed. And I said, so how do you want this to work? You're still going to be the CEO in title. You're the founder. Which decisions do you want to make? Which decisions should I make? And he said, that's easy. It's your ball. You run with it. You're making all the decisions. You act like a CEO. I was like, OK. Uh, that's wonderful clarity. Thank you for that. <laughs> and <laughs> and um, here's what I didn't expect. So Reed is um, extraordinarily thoughtful and inquisitive and brilliant. And he loves to keep his options open. Uh, optionality is a first principle. It's one of the things that has made him a legendary investor in Silicon Valley. And I realized shortly after joining, there were 338 people there my first day at the company. And I realized every interaction I would have with every one of these 338 people was essentially a job interview. For as long as I was in this interim role, at any time, Reed could call anyone into his office and say, what'd you think? Now, contrast that with the way most CEOs get the gig. You interview a few members of the board who are probably on a search committee. You interview with a few uh, current executives. And you get the job. And then you're in a position of influence and power. And most people then exert that influence and power. That was not the role that I was in from day one. And what started as something I was highly conscious of, uh, this relationship I felt with every individual as if they could be interviewing me, as if it was an interview process, that imbues you with a certain degree of humility. We've all been in the interview process, right? Sitting across from someone who's ultimately going to make a decision on your livelihood. It's very humbling. And that's the way I was inculcated into this role. Mm. Uh, that energy uh, was very humbling. And when I finally got the full-time job, I never wanted to lose that energy, ever. I, I think it's, um, it's a really important part of how to lead effectively, is to carry that kind of humility with you and recognize we are all individuals. We are all human beings. We are all in this together. And yes, some people may have more decision-making capacity or capabilities or influence than others within a hierarchical organization. But when you treat people uh, with that kind of respect, it's incredibly powerful. And, and when I heard you say that, Jeff, um, essentially these, in some ways, hundreds of different interactions, um, a broad interview kind of process, it, it's the beginning of then seeing the people that you're working with as people, mm. um, which I've heard you say this, and I've heard others around viewing compassion 
as the acknowledgement of an interdependence that we have, and not just the CEO sitting in his or her office and directing given their positional responsibility. And so in some ways, that entire kind of process logically sets you up for the type of leader that you are and became and are. And so the final question for me before I open it up to, um, to our friends here is, um, there is a position of CEO, um, what it means, the perception of it, the trappings, the, the one type of interview that normally occurs. And then there is what you went through um, that seems to be more akin to who you are, given your origin story, what you went through at Yahoo, and what Reid Hoffman saw. When you think about the tension, if there is any, between the notion of what a CEO should be in the corporate sector versus your notion of compassionate leader. Mm. Talk about the, about the intersection there and where it's most difficult to execute. Well, at this point, I, I can't separate them. Uh, they are one and the same. It, it's a model for management. It's a model for leadership. It's something that's become a first principle to me personally. It's something that we teach at the company. Uh, the importance of managing compassionately. Uh, one of our uh, six codified values is that relationships matter. And if you scratch the surface of that, you'll see uh, compassion, treating one another with compassion has become uh, foundational uh, to LinkedIn as an organization. But I think about the benefits of managing compassionately. Put aside the virtue of treating people with compassion and being there for other people. Uh, there are amazing benefits that take place, uh, some of which are extremely timely given the, the, the current era and the modern era that we're operating in, all of us collectively. I think first and foremost, you know, I was, I was just sharing stories with Reed uh, or about Reed, and it, it turns out Reed was very heavily invested in my success, making me successful. And one thing I didn't share with you, by the way, was after joining the company, this is a great example of compassion. After joining the company on the first day I set foot there, Reed physically took himself out of the office for roughly eight of the first 10 weeks I was there. Mm. He was mm. traveling on vacation, going to events, going to conferences, taking vacation, et cetera. And he did this very, very purposefully. He did it because he recognized that no matter how many times we explained to people my responsibility, they would reflexively go back to him as the founder of the company. And it was very important for people to come to me so I could establish that kind of connective tissue. And that was an act of compassion. He, he might not have necessarily characterized it that way. But him investing in my success was investing in his success mm. and the company's success. Mm. And so that's one of the, the most important elements of managing compassionately, that when you are being there for other people within your organization, when you are thinking about the world through their perspective, and through their lens, when you're investing in them and helping them to achieve their goals. Uh, you're not only helping them to be successful, you're helping the team to be successful, you're helping the company to be successful, and as a result, you're helping yourself to be successful. So in, in that regard, they, there's no conflict whatsoever. Mm. This idea of being an effective CEO and, and being compassionate are very, very much aligned. So that's one. Mm. The, the second area of alignment is that I believe, and I was taught this many, many years ago, that the long-term value of any company is driven by the speed and quality of its decision-making. Full stop. Mm. There's a lot of variables that go into that. But if you ever want to see how certain companies have experienced the success that they've had, and you talk to the board members that have been there the whole ride, or the CEO or the executives, they'll be able to point to a few inflection times. And they'll say, this decision, the decision to acquire this company, the decision to launch this product, the decision to tackle this, uh, this crisis head on, those were the things that ultimately determined the value of the company. In order to put the company in a position to make high quality decisions with speed, you need shorthand. You need a group of decision makers who trust one another. Otherwise, the amount of back and forth and churn, you've seen it. Mm. When litigate, a, litigate, I litigate. I mean, it's nonstop. It's nonstop. It's questioning everyone and everything constantly, especially when you're disagreeing with one another. And to the extent you are building an organization, you're building a team based on compassion, you demonstrate that you're there for one another. And when you feel that in a meeting, when you feel that when there's maximum tension, that the other person still has your back, 
that they're looking out for your interests. That becomes the foundation for trust. Mm. And that trust becomes the foundation for shorthand. Mm. And the shorthand becomes the foundation for faster, higher quality decisions. Mm. So in that regard, I also think being an effective CEO and cultivating that and acting compassionately are very much aligned. The third one is the most timely. And when you manage compassionately, it requires you to put yourself in the shoes of other people, not just your employees, but all of your key stakeholders, all of them, your customers, your investors, the press, analysts, your local community. And when you're managing those stakeholders with compassion, when you're putting yourself in the shoes of these people, it enables you to ask difficult questions, questions you wouldn't normally ask if you were only seeing the world through your own lens and approaching challenging situations based on your own experiences, your own perspectives. We can get out of your shoes and think about it through other people's perspectives. You'll ask a different set of questions. And you may not like some of the answers. But having that kind of dialogue is going to enable you to avoid the unintended consequences mm. of your decisions. And it feels like you can't go a day without reading headlines where companies uh, in the technology industry, despite the best of their intentions, they weren't trying to actively or explicitly go out of their way to do harm to anyone, but made decisions at some point in the maturation of the company, probably for the sake of achieving a business objective, and there were dire unintended consequences, and harm was done. Mm. And to the extent we can manage compassionately, we can begin to address those unintended consequences before they're actually executed. Mm. And so that's another example where I see very little daylight between being an effective CEO and managing with compassion. Great, Jeff, thanks for that. We are now, um, let's open it up for, um, for folks here, and there are microphones, and so if we can begin. Um, Great, and uh, just real quickly, we have two mic runners. Um, if you have your 20-minute theory on compassion, this probably is not the best place to share that, <laughs> or your business plan or business proposal, but if you could ask questions that are short and to the point, we can get as many for questions sure. in as possible. Thank you. Compassion Shark Tank, this is not the time for <laughs> this is not compassion, Shark Tank. compassion episode of Shark Tank. Hi, I'm Diane from Oakland, California. Um, how do we assist CEOs I should put it the word. What, are, what will um, assist in um, dealing with the barriers of compassionate leadership? Because I'm thinking specifically of wayfarers who, when, when, when challenged about selling mattresses to the, um, I'll, I, thank you, detention centers, um, and they said, well, we're a business. And so, and then they gave money to the Red Cross. They still sold mattresses to the detention centers and said, and their employees protested. And then they said, oh, well, we're a business and our responsibility is to sell and to meet our bottom line objectives and we'll give some money to the Red Cross. Uh, so the question was... So what gets in the way? What, what, how can we address that orientation that it's about the bottom line? The, so the, I think the first part, uh, when you started, you were asking, how can you help a CEO to, yeah, to, manage, to, yeah. mm -hmm. to manage more compassionately? And then I'll try to circle back to the situation with Wayfair. Uh, how you can help your CEO manage uh, more compassionately, there's a, a few different ways to answer that question. Uh, one is recognize that the CEO is also a person. Oftentimes, people hear about managing compassionately and assume it is a hierarchical dynamic where the person with greater authority or influence within an organization should be managing the people that report to them with compassion. And that's the end of the story. But it works in both directions. And when it's not necessarily specific to a CEO, but any manager, anyone who's responsible for teams, when the team can put themselves in the shoes of that person, it's invaluable. It's invaluable because you start to get ahead of challenges and problems that uh, that person could ultimately face. And you're solving them before they ever get uh, to their attention. And that's a way to really start to generate a scalable operation. Uh, so I think that's important. It also, that can also alleviate tension. You know, sometimes people assume that their managers or leaders or CEOs, um, they, they forget that they're people. 
and they just assume them to have, you know, uh, unwavering uh, uh, energy and uh, unconditional uh, commitment to doing the right thing in every single situation. And while we all aspire to that, we're all people. You know, we're all going to make mistakes. We're all frail at times. And so to the extent you can put yourself in the shoes of these individuals and think about how they're trying to do things and the things that they're experiencing, that can also bring a team together. And it's, it's incredibly supportive uh, for the people that you're working with. Another thing that you can do to help people uh, in your organization, <clears throat> I'm not getting emotional. It's an amen from a kind bar I just had, I swear. If I was getting emotional, I would admit it. I'd have no problem with it. That will be in my session later. People getting, uh, <laughs> you know, I'm getting all choked up. And that almond just hit me so hard. <laughs> so another thing that's uh, uh, really important uh, is modeling the behavior yourselves and not just waiting for the people in charge to be doing it. Uh, when people uh, look at LinkedIn from the outside looking in and they are very complimentary about our culture, our values, or the way we operate the organization, uh, sometimes I think it's easy to give credit to the people in charge, but at the end of the day, I'm one of 14,500 employees. Mm -hmm. And while I can help set the tone and, and certainly model the behavior on a stage like this in front of a big group of people, it requires every single person at the company to embrace our culture, to embrace our values, to embrace first principles like managing compassionately and acting accordingly. I, I cannot do it alone. The leadership team of LinkedIn cannot do it alone. It requires all of us, and the same holds for every one of your organizations. With regard to uh, Wayfair and uh, this recent headline, uh, I had not heard uh, the way you just described it, that the response to the employee uh, activism and, and protest was that we're a business, and this is how we generate revenue. And what I'm about to say is not going to be directed towards Wayfair, because I don't I don't know the situation, and I have not walked a mile in the shoes of that CEO. And I'm being serious. I'm oftentimes asked the question, what would I have done if I was in that position? Yeah. I'm not in that position. I'm in this position. And from the outside looking in to try to question Without how someone did what they did, um, mm -hmm. it is not compassionate, to put it mildly. But this concept of justifying an organization's behavior uh, through business objectives uh, I think there's a different way to do things. And I think it begins with an organization's sense of purpose. And coming back to what we were describing earlier is a mission and a vision. The dream true north has a vision and your mission, that singular overarching objective. And I think uh, there are opportunities for companies to define their vision, to define their mission from day one in such a way where doing well and doing good are in no ways at odds that they are highly symbiotic. At LinkedIn, by way of example, our vision is to create economic opportunity for every member of the global workforce. There's over three and a half billion people in the global workforce. We're gonna do a lot of good for the world by virtue of realizing this vision. We're also gonna create a lot of value. They're not at odds. So we are very purpose-driven, and I'm reminded of that by our employees all the time. Uh, God forbid I get up on stage and forget to start with mission and vision and I go straight to a financial objective, mm. I I'm never going to hear the end of it from our employees. I, I've, I've got plenty of stories for you. It's actually quite true, and I learned that the hard way many, many years ago uh, when I talked about a long-term business plan and then sat down with some folks later and they asked me if we had changed our mission statement. I said, what? And they said, yeah, you started with the revenue, long-term revenue objective. I'm not here for the revenue objective. That's fine and good. I'm here for the mission. I'm here for the vision. And it was eye-opening, to say the least. It's not supposed to be about generating every incremental dollar of revenue or every incremental percent of growth. Uh, those should be means of realizing the end. And the end should be however a company, however a group of people define their collective sense of purpose. Thank you. So, over here. Uh, I'm Judy from Hong Kong, and I would like to ask a question. <clears throat> it's also not emotional, it's just my throat. Did you also have a Kind bar? I'm going to talk to Daniel Lubitsky, the CEO and founder of Kind. <laughs> um, my question will be related to how you see the relationship between compassion and competition, mm -hmm. because I think that in today's world, there's a lot of competition. Like Internally, people compete to get promotion or not to get laid off and externally you compete. 
But I'm of the view that that's no need for competition. And for individual, you need to align with your own true not knowing who you are and live that and to be striving. And as a business, as you just shared beautifully, you need to know what is your business purpose and to align with that business purpose. And then you will just authentically strive. Mm. Uh, so in that sense, there's actually no need for, for competition. So I would like to hear your view. And in LinkedIn, do you have competition? Are you uh, very intentionally, intentionally uh, avoid competition? Uh, internally? Uh, yeah, internally, oh, but also your overall view. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I'll come back to the external uh, sense of competition. Uh, internally, uh, there's, it's not an environment I would describe uh, as internally competitive with one another. It is uh, one in which we are highly, highly aligned in terms of our sense of purpose. And not only the what, in terms of the mission and the vision, but the how the culture and the values. And uh, I, I described and, and defined the way we think about vision and mission. We also distinguish uh, culture and values. Culture is the collective personality of our organization. It's who we are, and even more importantly, who we aspire to be. And our, vision, our, our values, rather, are the first principles upon which we make day-to-day -day operating decisions. So the values nest underneath the culture. And there is incredibly strong alignment because we're so clear in our intention and because we've been so clear internally and externally uh, with the what and the how. We have a tendency to attract people of like mind. We don't want groupthink. We don't want everyone to be the same. We're all in on diversity, inclusion, and belonging. It's very, very important to optimize outcomes and decisions. Uh, but we, we do have people that are galvanized and aligned around our sense of the what and the how. And so you may have some organizations that actually uh, ferment that kind of competition. You hear all the time about uh, organizations that will set up two teams doing the exact same thing to see who wins. And the team that wins you know, gets the, the, the prize, and I guess the other team moves on to a different uh, initiative or a different project. Uh, we do things differently, and I'm not suggesting one is right and one is wrong. It's just the way we do things is, is different than that. Uh, we are all trying to achieve the same mission and vision, and we are constantly reinforcing that. And we are all trying to do that in a similar way in terms of the, the how, in terms of our culture and our values. Externally, when it comes to competition, I think competition can be very, very healthy because I think it creates the right sense of urgency. It's a wonderful for forcing mechanism to ensure that uh, people are doing their best work. Uh, because if, if you're not doing your best work and you have a worthy competitor, uh, they're going to surpass you. I don't believe that should be an excuse to uh, allow the uh, ends to justify the means. And I don't believe that should be an excuse uh, to compromise integrity or your values. And I believe in that um, uh, with great conviction. I also, I mentioned uh, Fred Kaufman earlier, who uh, once suggested something very interesting on this exact front, on uh, the reconciliation between compassion and competition. Mm. And the way Fred liked to uh, think about it was, uh, at the end of the day, if you are truly mission driven, if you truly believe in your sense of purpose, and you're competing with another entity, uh, who has a similar objective, and it may not be stated in the same words, but they're trying to accomplish the same thing. And for whatever reason they surpass you, great. Because it means the mission is going to be realized by someone. Mm. And if you're truly purpose-driven, that's a good thing, that the purpose will be realized. And hopefully companies and competitors push themselves, push each other to a faster realization of that end game. And it leads to more innovation and higher quality experiences and lower prices and a bunch of goodness in the world. So that's one philosophical way of thinking about it. I say philosophical because when you're in it and you're competing and your competition is winning, you know, in some cases, uh, it's going to be mutually exclusionary. And it may be winner take all. And that's going to create a lot of uncertainty for the organization or the people who are being surpassed and whose organizations may not be able to invest the same way or unfortunately may have to undertake layoffs. And that's the reality of the situation. So I think competition can be a very good and healthy thing uh, when it's outside of your organization. 
uh, inside your organization, I think some would argue it could be a very similar dynamic, but uh, for LinkedIn at least, we try to ensure that we're all on the same page. Thank you. We have time for one final question. Right here. Hey, hey Jeff and David. Hey. Um, first of all, just to say this out loud, thank you for being an inspired leader and such a great role model of conscious capitalism, et cetera. I think we're in such a ripe opportunity to have more leaders walk the talk. And thank so, you. thank you. Um, I had an aha when you were talking about the speed and quality of decision making. And how that happens is that we trust each other and have each other's back. And the aha was like, oh, where does that start? What's the root, root cause? And what came to me, and it goes back to wisdom and compassion together, it's like, let me put it this way, see if this makes sense. Like a wise, adult conscious part of Jeff has compassion for the wounded uh-oh part inside of Jeff. So it's like that wise part of you says, I've got your back to that scared part inside of you. And the more you have that kind of wise compassion going on inside of you, you're able to do that with the team and other people. So I'm curious if that, like what's your inner, your inner game that works for you? I felt like I was in therapy for a moment. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm starting to get emotional. I just I felt like, Talk, like, talk wow, later. This is deep. This inner child is crying out for more wisdom and compassion. Uh, I wish I could tell you I practiced uh, self-compassion as well as I at least attempt to practice compassion with others. Uh, there have been multiple occasions where people have heard me uh, speak on the subject and have um, asked me about self-compassion, which I think is uh, a wonderful thing to aspire to, but I am no expert in self-compassion. I, I need to probably be far more compassionate with myself in terms of um, setting my own expectations, in terms of forgiveness, uh, in terms of a whole host of things that I, I guess to a large extent, I, I do a better job of practicing with other people. Uh, but I love the way you frame the question, and it's a reminder of the importance of self-compassion. And uh, the world would be a, a much better place if we all started there and we all cut ourselves some slack, or as my wife likes to say, who speaks English as a second language, cut ourselves some slacks. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff Weiner. <laughs> <laughs>